from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. I'm Peggy Perlstein, head of the Hebraic section here in the African and Middle Eastern Division of the Library of Congress. Welcome to today's program, co-sponsored with the European Division, Dr. Ileana Adler, a longtime researcher here at the library, will be speaking about her new book, The Education of Jewish Girls in Tsarist Russia. And I'm going to ask Ms. Sharon Horowitz, our senior reference librarian, to introduce the speaker. Thanks. Uh, on behalf of the Hebraic section and the European division, welcome to the African and Middle Eastern division reading room. Our speaker today is Dr. Eliana Adler, research associate at the Joseph and Rebecca Meyerhoff Center for Jewish Studies, University of Maryland College Park, and also Sossland Foundation Fellow at the Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies of the United States Holocaust Museum. She received her PhD in modern Jewish history from Brandeis University, where she also received her MA in women's studies and Near Eastern and Judaic studies. Dr. Adler is the author of many articles and encyclopedia entries. She has presented her work at various conferences and workshops. Currently, at the Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies, she is researching the cultural and educational institutions created in Jewish evacuee and refugee communities in Central Asia. We are delighted to have Dr. Adler here with us. This afternoon, she will speak about her new book, In Her Hands, The Education of Jewish Girls in Tsarist Russia. For those who are interested, the book will be available for sale in the back after the lecture. Before I turn the podium over to Dr. Adler, let me make an administrative announcement. This event is being videotaped for subsequent broadcast on the library's webcast and other media. There will be a formal question and answer period after the lecture in which members of the audience are encouraged to ask questions and offer comments. But please be advised that your voice and image may be recorded and later broadcast as part of this event. By participating in the question and answer period, you are consenting to the library's possible reproduction and transmission of your remarks. And now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Eliana Adler. Thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure to have the opportunity of speaking here. I have been in and out of this room and other rooms in the library as a researcher since um, coming to Maryland in, I think, 2002. And I am, every time I'm here, I'm just amazed at the depth and breadth of the collection, um, things that are so obscure that I couldn't even find them in the original countries that they came from, sometimes are here. Sometimes I'll find something by another author that I wasn't even expecting when I do some searches. So it's just always a surprise and always interesting to work here. And in particular, I have um, enjoyed my time here in the African and Middle East Division, in the European Division, and also at the Law Library. I've spent a lot of time over there also. So thanks for bringing me back to this wonderful place to present some of my findings. Um, this examination of education for Jewish girls in 19th century Russia was motivated by a number of questions. First of all, there just was very little information out there when I began this project as a doctoral student a really long time ago. Uh, numerous books and articles have been written about the Cheder, the central primary educational institution for Jewish boys in Eastern Europe and really in medieval and modern Europe as a whole. Um, but the information about girls' education was sparse, anecdotal, and frustratingly opaque. And I'll just give you one example. Louis Greenberg, writing in the 1940s, opened a lengthy description of the Cheder with the following observation. I quote, in fact, he says, there was practically no illiteracy among Russian Jewry. For almost every male, and in many cases females too, could read the prayer book and the Bible. And then he goes on to talk about the cheder for pages and pages, leaving us with this 
sort of enchanting little piece of information. M many Jewish girls could read the Bible in the prayer book, but nothing else about it. How did they learn how? Who taught them? Where did they learn? How much could they understand what they were reading? Um, and, and there's also in the literature of Eastern Europe, there's the image of the um, pious grandmother reading the Tzenarena, the um, Yiddish Teich um, translation of the Bible, of women reading from women's prayers, the Tchinas, it is very prevalent, very normative, and there again, but without much sense of how that came about. Even more intriguing, I think, for me, was the emergence in the late in the late 19th century of some very educated and some very fascinating Jewish women. Among them, just to give a couple examples on, I guess, your left, is uh, Gessie Gelfman, one of the first um, uh, revolutionaries. She was imp died in prison, in Azaris prison, for um, being part of the successful um, effort to assassinate Tsar Alexander II. Um, on the other side, um, is Paulina Vangeroff, a um, prominent educator and Zionist of the late 19th and early 20th century. So where did people like that? Obviously, Gessie Gelfman had to have known Russian. She was part of a Russian revolutionary band. Um, Paulina Vangeroff knew Hebrew. She taught Hebrew to Jewish girls in Vilna in the 20th century. So here again, where did these people come from? These are some of the questions that motivated this research, and in order to answer those questions as best I can, I want to take us back to 1831, the early part of the 19th century, and the city of Vilna. In 1831, a man by the name of Chevel Perel opened the first private modern school for Jewish girls in the Pale of Settlement, the area in Russia where Jews were permitted to live. There, when I, I emphasize that it was a private and a modern school, but it was also just the first school for Jewish girls in, in the Pale of Settlement, the first school at all. Most boys at this period, in the, in the 1830s, attended the Jewish Cheder, if only for a few years. Uh, in 1847, the Tsarist government estimated that there were over 5,000 Chaderim in the empire, and that's undoubtedly an underestimate. There were plenty of ones they didn't know about. Boys learned to decode Hebrew, texts, and the rudiments of their faith in these schools. A few went on to the more rigorous yeshivas, the higher level of education, but most entered the family business, apprenticeship, tried to earn a living in whatever way they could after their bar mitzvahs. Girls, by contrast, had no access to formal Jewish education until Peril's school opened. However, by 1881, 50 years later, there were well over 100 private schools for Jewish girls. Uh, each one was unique, and um, as much as I would like to, I can't talk about all of them today. So I'm going to use Pearl's school as sort of a case study and talk about what he did, what he founded, um, how it changed over time, and look at a few different areas of his school. and. Um, at the end, I'm happy to answer questions more specifically about some of these areas. This is really an overview or more generally about the phenomenon overall. All right, so Shevel Shmulevich Perel was born around the turn of the 19th century into the petty townsman estate, the Mischansva. He was educated at home until he entered the, entered the Vilna Gymnasium. I actually went looking for his records and I was unable to find them, but um, I, that doesn't mean that he didn't really go there. The, the, many things have happened in Eastern Europe since the early part of the 19th century, and none of them really conducive to the preservation of documents. Um, he, this was very unusual for the period. And I'm in, inclined to believe him also because of his fluency in Russian. He, he carried on lengthy correspondence with the government about his school and about his efforts to expand it, and all in quite good Russian. Just to give an example of how rare this was, um, in 1824, so slightly before this, in all of the secondary sc schools uh, in the whole Vilna province, there were um, two Jewish boys listed as in attendance. And 
1841, when things had already changed a bit, there were 13 Jewish boys in this same region studying in Russian schools. And most of these would have been, again, in the secondary schools. It was much more common for those few Jews who did go to Russian educational institutions to attend the higher level schools rather than the lower level elementary schools. There were also more secondary than elementary schools, but that's another interesting question about the Russian education. Um, when Pearl graduated, he was probably the only Jew in his school and one of a small minority of Jews in Vilna to be fluent in reading and writing Russian. So after this somewhat unorthodox education, he proceeded down a seemingly more traditional path in terms of his family life. He married in his early 20s, and he and his wife Sarah, about whom nothing else is recorded, had six children who survived into adulthood. Their first child was born in 1822. Nine years later, he opened this school for Jewish girls. That Pearl became an educator is not at all surprising. I forgot to put up the picture before of the traditional education, the Cheder Malamed, the Cheder teacher, and his wife, turn of the century, Lithuania. Oops. Um, yes, okay. So, someone as educated as Peril, but without higher education, had very few other employment opportunities. Had his family had the means to let him go on to university, he could have become a dentist, a pharmacist. There were certain professions open to Jews. Um, for Russian non-Jews, for ethnic Russians, graduation from gymnasium meant a sure profession. They automatically, anyone who graduated a man from the gymnasium could enter into the civil service and have pretty much assured employment for life. Peril wasn't eligible for that, so not going to university, not being a Christian, very few options to him. There again, he couldn't teach in a Russian gymnasium himself, so a Jewish school made sense, but he wasn't going to become a Malamed. Uh, he didn't have the skills probably to do so, and I'm sure he didn't look the part either. Uh, I'm sure he was much more modern. I don't have any pictures of him than this Malamed. Um, so that he would go into Jewish education makes sense. The only remaining question is, why girls? And I, I've done a lot of thinking about that, and I, and I write about it at some length, but briefly, I think that he taught girls because of serendipity rather than because of an organized plan to do so. Um, there is some evidence that in 1830, Peril actually tried to open a school for Jewish boys, a modern school, this would have been, um, and um, it didn't work out. And what I imagine happened, although I don't have evidence of this, as, is that some of the families who Peril went to to try and interest them in his school for boys said that they weren't interested, but they had some daughters at home and might be a lot more comfortable offering their daughters a modern education than their sons. Vilna was, at this time, a, um, an emerging center of the Haskalah, of the Jewish Enlightenment, um, but a much more um, sort of fundamentally really a center of rabbinic scholarship and sending a Jewish boy to uh, a school where that boy wouldn't get a very strong foundation in traditional Jewish texts was going to be uh, a risk, a liability, and it was different for Jewish girls where there isn't the same, um, according to traditional Jewish law, the same requirements regarding her education in the Torah. Um, all right, so this is not to say that he didn't take his mission seriously, just because he may have sort of fallen into the education of Jewish girls. And I'll quote briefly from a, an 1848 request he wrote to the government. He says, it is common knowledge that the education of women represents one of the most important means of enlightenment among the men. Consequently, if the mother received proper education before marriage, she would be able to provide her children with the appropriate education. He came to appreciate the potential of his work, and of course he was smart enough to know what to say in official correspondence. But I, um, but nonetheless, I, I believe that he started out uh, with the idea of teaching boys. By 1830, at the, around the time when he opened this school, there were already a handful of other modern 
schools for Jewish boys in the Pale of Settlement. There was one ill-fated one that opened in Uman in 1822. Uh, there was a more successful one that opened in Odessa in 1826. Elements of the Jewish community, at least in these larger and more cosmopolitan areas, had a growing interest in the benefits of modern education. Peril was ideally suited for this kind of work. And um, Vilna turned out to be a successful place to begin his first school. We may never know exactly the thoughts and actions that preceded his decision to open this school. What is clear is that it uh, thrived for several decades. And there were clearly members of the Jewish community who supported Peril's work and sent their daughters to his school. The first school for Jewish girls in Russia was able to provide thousands of Jewish girls, literally thousands. I, he was open for a long time, and I have the numbers of his enrollments, um, with a foundation in the Russian language and other subjects. So what were these subjects? That's the next section I want to discuss. Um, how, in fact, would one create a Jewish school with so few models to work with? When Peril School opened in 1831, there were two classes. As of 1850, um, on the closure of a rival school, he requested and he uh, accepted the students from that other school and, and requested permission to add a third class. And this, what I have up here now, is an 1854 advertisement for the school. It's half is in Yiddish, half is in Russian. It's, it's a poster. It was hung up around Vilna to um, interest people in his school. And it goes through the classes and a brief sort of justification for what the school does, as well as something about the pricing of the education. According to this advertisement, uh, the school offered Russian, German, math, and writing skills in all of the classes. And as for Jewish subjects, Yiddish was offered in the first class and religion only in the second and third. Students took geography in the upper two classes and Russian history only in the third and highest level. Parents could pay extra for their daughters to study crafts, dance, and music. And by 1861, Peril had added yet another uh, level to the school, so he just kept expanding. In 1869, the school, by this time already in the hands of Peril's son-in-law, uh, a man by the name of Avram Wolf, um, filed a complete yearly report with the rabbinical seminary. At that point, the school day ran from 9 to 12.45, Sunday through Thursday, a shorter day on Friday. Um, languages remained, at that point, central to the curriculum, but Yiddish had been dropped. And students in the first through third classes had religion twice a week and Russian four times a week. I don't have his curriculum from the very first opening from 1830, but I, even in this period from, 18, from the 1850s through the 1860s, we see a gradual expansion of the number of classes, um, the times that courses met per week. The school is becoming more serious educationally. Other changes. Um, there was a brief period when he taught Polish. That became quite politically unpopular quickly, and there were a couple of other Jewish schools that also schools for girls that taught Polish over the years, but by 1861, the second Polish uprising, that was clearly out of the question. Yiddish also disappears from the curriculum fairly early. Peril did not add Hebrew, but almost every other private school for Jewish girls opened after 1850, and that's when most of them were opened. His is quite early, and then there's a trickle of them afterward, and really after 1850, they start opening in larger numbers. Almost all of those taught Hebrew to the girls. Russian was the mainstay of the curriculum in his school and in all of the other ones, the course that met most frequently. Um, the, the course usually second under that that met the most times per week was religion. Not so much in peril school. Not, not, it didn't meet that often, and it didn't even meet in all the classes. But in most of the other schools, religion also met every day or at least four days a week. Um, obviously, religion had to be taught in these schools. They were Jewish schools. 
but there wasn't much of a precedent to go on for how religion ought to be taught. Um, Judaism in two hours a week, even in four hours a week, um, hadn't really been done before, certainly not in the Tsarist Empire. The Cheder was all religion all the time. It was nothing but religion. So how to take out what is central to Judaism and teach it in only a few hours a week. Um, Peril himself, as well as the edu other educators who followed him, relied on German language textbooks in the early years. That is, there were modern schools for Jewish children, boys and girls, in the German-speaking lands, and they were able to bring in those textbooks. They passed through the censor, successfully most of them, and use those at first to teach religion in their new Jewish schools in Russia. Later on, they began to write their own textbooks. And this is the frontispiece of, um, it had two sides. It opens on the Russian side and on the Hebrew side of a religion textbook created by Lazar Berman, who was a, first he ran a private school for Jewish girls in the Lithuanian area of Dubnov, and then he was, um, he went to St. Petersburg where he was asked to run a private school for Jewish boys, and his wife, Anna Berman, ran a parallel school for Jewish girls and in, in the capital in Petersburg for many years. And this, while he was working there, this is the textbook he created, Moste Dat Moshe, Zakono Chitl, which was quite widely used in a, in a lot of these schools. The books employed in these schools tended to offer, and this is true of both the German language ones and later the Russian language ones, um, it tended to fall into two camps. That is, either they offered a condensed version of sacred history, that is, the Bible, but a shortened version with just the good bits, just the bits that were considered to be important rather than all of the historical text. Um, and then the other model was more like a catechism, a sort of statement of faith based on either traditional sources, Maimonides' principles, sometimes the Ten Commandments, or sometimes written expressly for this purpose of teaching and the creation of the teachers themselves. Jewish girls were also taught the rudiments of prayer in all of the schools that I have examined. And this, I think, is an interesting combination because the textbooks are fairly new. They have a more rationalist approach to Judaism. They're teaching a, a more modern, enlightened idea of what the religion is about. But on the other hand, Teaching Jewish girls prayer is about the most traditional um, possible way of preparing them for their futures. Insofar as we can understand what happened in Jewish homes, um, in the traditional Jewish home during this period where there wasn't formal education offered, Jewish girls were taught by family members to read the prayer book. That was considered to be an important task as well as to run a kosher kitchen. It was among the things that Jewish girls needed to know. So in these schools that are in some ways so cutting edge and so modern, there's also this sort of recognition that the people who they're teaching are maybe not so modern themselves and that nobody wants to send their daughter to a Jewish girl and have her come back not knowing her prayers. That, that's the whole point to a certain degree of, of what these families could imagine. And, and so we see the um, sort of the, the modernizing efforts but also the degree to which those were held in check by the communities in which they functioned. Um, and you may be wondering at this point, who taught in these schools? Was peril fairly typical, or are we looking at other types of educational models? Um, peril was not entirely typical. That is, he was in the sense that all of these teachers had to be Russian speaking. In order to legally open a private school for Jewish girls, and I can only look at the ones that were legal because the illegal ones aren't on the books. I don't, their correspondence isn't in the Ministry of Education files. Um, one had to know Russian. One had to be able to correspond with the government in Russian. Um, so in that sense, these people um, could not function entirely within the Yiddish speaking Jewish community. They had to have stepped outside to some degree and learned Russian but many of them tended to be much more self-educated in, in knowledge of secular subjects in Russian than Peril was, that is not to have gone to the gymnasium. Um, th this table shows a little bit about what we can know about the educators. 
Um, most of them were men. This is, I think, not surprising at all. Of those men, of those 94 or so men who opened private schools for Jewish girls, and really, I, I don't know enough information to talk about all the teachers whom they hired. I, I can talk about the principals, because I have some information on them, but most of these principals taught some of the subjects in their schools. They didn't teach all of them, but I, I simply can't know about all the people they hired. So this is the principals. Of those men, approximately half of them also taught in government-sponsored Jewish schools for, Jew schools for Jewish boys. Um, also, a number of them, uh, nine or 10, were government rabbis. So these were people who had had some secular education, who allied themselves to some degree with the Russian government, who were employed by the Russian government, oftentimes before they opened these private schools for Jewish girls, and who had to already be functional in Russian. The other half of the men, hard to know exactly where their education come, came from. They don't have specific credentials written down, but they managed. A lot of them don't write very good Russian, but that's actually better for me. That's much easier to read in some ways, except if their handwriting is poor. Um, more surprising, I think, is the number of women. And look, approximately a third, a fourth, of the educators um, who opened private schools for Jewish girls were uh, women. Of those women, as you can see, most were Jewish women, and a pretty significant proportion were non-Jews. That's much less true of the men. There's one non-Jewish man, pretty much statistically insignificant, a much larger number of Jewish women. And briefly, I, I would say about that, that there were far fewer educational opportunities, uh, professional opportunities, for any women, um, educated women in the Pale of Settlement, all the more so for Jewish women, but also for non-Jews. Um, and so for some of them, uh, particularly in areas with very high concentration of Jews, this was a good option. Um, big cities often had a gymnasium for women and several private finishing schools. Graduates of these programs, if they did not immediately marry and leave the workforce, could hope to get a job in one of these same schools that they'd gone to. If they were unable to do so, they had very few other options. Suddenly, though, after 1831, there's this additional option of opening a private school for Jewish girls. Some enterprising non-Jewish women realized that they not only had the skills to run such schools, but that in many ways their religious and educational backgrounds actually provided a cachet of sorts. Wealthy Jewish families often wanted their daughters to receive a truly formal European education. What better way to do so than in a school run by a European educated Russian woman, but with religion, of course, taught by a local Jew whom she would hire. All right, um, a few thoughts on students now who were, in fact, the families who sent their daughters to these schools. Were they all from the wealthy elite, as is somewhat suggested in the case of these non-Jewish educators and also in Peril himself opening that first school? Um, in Peril School, in 1869, the age range of students was from 8 to 15. The majority were between 9 and 13. In that year, of his 85 students, 58 were members of the urban estate, and 27 came from merchant families. Several years later, or earlier, in 1861, of his 77 pupils, 12 were the daughters of merchants, and 65 of towns people. The estates are not um, really coterminous with class. It's, it's hard to talk about class in uh, late 19th century Russia, but basically, um, the merchants were the uh, elite of the Jewish community, the merchant uh, estate. And in, even in Peril School in Vilna, where there was some serious wealth, the majority of his students are not coming from merchant families. They're from um, the uh, town's estate families, who there wasn't exactly a middle class, but could be uh, quite a range in terms of um, how much um, expendable income they had. In this, Peril's distribution is similar to his successor schools. Many of the founding principals thought that they could 
um, attract mainly the daughters of the wealthy elite and that um, their schools would be well funded. What they found out was the reality was that they were, they were inundated with applicants who didn't necessarily have enough funds to uh, attend those schools, but very much wanted an education. Uh, and I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about funding in a moment, but just uh, another couple words about distribution. Um, the distribution within the classes was also quite uneven. So in 1861, for example, there were 36 girls in the preparatory class, the lowest class in Peril School, 22 in the first class, and nine and 10 respectively in the second and highest or third class. There was also a great deal of turnover in these schools. In January of 1869, for example, there were 50 girls enrolled in Peril School. Over the course of that calendar year, 75 more enrolled and another 40 left. And, and this is fairly typical. In 1869, the school could boast of no graduates. However, eight students left the school in order to study at other local secondary schools. So what do we make of this? I'd say there were two major reasons for all this turnover and for the heavy concentration at the bottom. Firstly, girls left because their families could no longer afford the tuition. Education, so paying tuition for education for a girl was still um, a luxury, um, and families who were in tough financial times, as many Jewish families were, particularly as the 19th century wore on, um, or had to move suddenly, often had to give up on an education, a formal education for their daughters. On the other hand, many families clearly came into these schools in order to use them as stepping stones to more prestigious uh, Russian schools. That is, their children didn't know Russian. They themselves couldn't teach them in the home. So they put them for a couple years in Peril School or one of the other schools, just until they knew enough to pass into one of the secondary schools where they could get a truly fine education. And this leads me back to the initial question I asked about were these girls, these girls who went to Peril School for a couple years and then went on to a gymnasium, um, are, are these some of the girls who later went on to become revolutionaries, to become Bundists, Zionists, um, to become activists or leaders in some other way? Um, Jewish women were a fairly small percentage of Bolsheviks, although overrepresented, larger in the Menshevik party, um, quite active in Zionist movement, and they formed um, over 40% of leadership in the Bund, and this is a picture of a Bundist group in Grodno around 1907. And you'll see many women present in the Jewish Labor Bund. Um, these women were literate in, in Yiddish, often in Russian, as well as other European languages. Did they go to Pearl School or other schools in order to get there? Unfortunately, it turns out to be very hard to know. Um, a few went on to be teachers, and those ones I can trace. For example, Peril's daughter, Flora, um, graduated from her father's school, went on to get a secondary education, and then returned to his school teaching uh, French and Russian for many years, and um, her husband became the principal after her father retired, so they went on to run the school together for another couple decades. Uh, and there are some other examples of girls who went on to be teachers. It's, it's much harder to trace an exact line between um, these other more famous types and these schoolgirls. One reason is that um, if you've ever read uh, an autobiography by a revolutionary, the, the sort of format of the genre requires a dismissal of the past and of whatever school system and family one came from. Um, revolutionaries have to show, uh, having read many, they, they, they tend to be fair, fairly formulaic, that at an early age they realized that there was injustice around them, in their homes, in their communities, and thus they left, they went on. They don't typically talk about what a great foundational education they had before they you know, went on and discovered politics later on. So I haven't been able to yet, I'm still hoping, um, to make any direct ties. Uh, I have made some direct ties between women who went on to get a higher education. And the Jews were also uh, overrepresented in these groups. 
there were um, about 100 uh, women studying, Russian women studying in Switzerland in 1870 when they were recalled and told that they um, wouldn't be able to retain their Russian citizenship if they didn't come back. About 30 of them were Jews. Um, also, there were periodic attempts at um, higher education. Um, in Petersburg, in Kherson, and elsewhere um, over the course of the late 19th century, and there again, many Jewish women involved, and, and some of them I've been able to show started out in these schools. A few words about economics of these schools. Um, something I didn't uh, go into this project with the slightest bit of interest in, but it actually turned out to be um, quite informative, and I hope you'll find it so also. Perel, Chevel Perel, was an innovator not only in his decision to open this school and in terms of his curriculum, but also in the ways in which he kept his school open for so many years. By 1843, Perel had managed to obtain a yearly subsidy from the government. He got on very well with local and national authorities, and he kept up a constant stream of funding requests over the course of his many years as principal. It seems that he was able to use the favorable impression gathered by uh, Lilienthal, Max Lilienthal, who visited the school in 1843, to get that initial subsidy. Later on, that subsidy moved from the Korobka, the meat tax, to the candle tax. And um, in 1850, when Perel thought, sought to expand his school, he requested additional funding from the candle tax. At this time, there was no other girls' school receiving money from the candle tax funds. The candle tax funds were actually devised in order to fund the state-sponsored school system for Jewish boys, um, which was founded in 1844 as a means to make the Jews uh, Russian and less different. Um, so uh, the Jews were funded to pay for the school system to change them, and but the, the schools, didn't turn out to be all that popular or all that successful, and some of the money was just sitting around. And essentially, Perel figured that out, um, and word spread quickly. Um, so that within the next few years, somehow, and I don't know how they all knew about this, everyone else who opened a school for Jewish girls um, was also requesting extra funding from the candle tax funds. In addition to that, they used tuition fee scales to the advantage of the school, and this, I think, is still widely practiced in private schools. The flat tuition rate in 1854 for Peril School was 10 rubles per year, fairly modest, a little more than a cheder, but not a huge amount of money. However, he also offered supplementary courses, as I mentioned, in crafts, dance, and music for an additional 50 rubles, a couple afternoons a week. Um, and students could eat meals at the school for an additional 150 rubles. This rather unbalanced collection of options allowed him to simultaneously obtain as much money as possible from the wealthy families and make it possible for families of limited means to send their daughters to the schools. He was effectively creating subsidies from the rich to the poor. Other, educat other educators followed Perel's lead in both of these ways. By the 1860s, um, everyone who opened a school requested candle tax funds, and Perel's savvy use of tuition scales was also emulated elsewhere. OK, so it's a nice story. Um, Chevrolet Perel took a chance. He opened a private school for Jewish girls in 1831. By 1881, there were over 100 of them. Um, his school was still going strong, although he was no longer living. Um, over the course of his life, he received many honors. He was granted honorary citizenship, quite a high regard from the government. In 1858, the Minister of Education himself visited Perel's school. Um, but beyond his personal triumph, um, or the existence of 100 or so schools, what does this really teach us? Um, I want to begin by using geography as a metaphor. Something of the nature of Perel's vision and the degree of change over 50 years can be discerned in examining the location of his school. Perel opened his new school on the street in Vilna, referred to as Deitschegas by the Jews or Nimetska Ulitsa by the Russians, 
Um, obviously, it was where the Germans had been the German neighborhood. Um, until the first decade of the 19th century, um, Deutsche Gasse was the outer edge of what was a contained Jewish community. The Jews all lived on the other side of Deutsche Gasse. Um, as of the first decade of the 19th century, Jews were allowed to move beyond that border. And Peril put his school right there on Deutsche Gasse. I like to think that it's meaningful. Maybe that was just the only building he could find to rent. Um, the school existed at the very border of the Jewish community and the non-Jewish one, representing the cutting edge of education and of the possibility of interaction between Jews and their neighbors. By the end of the period of study, by the 1880s, Deutsche Gasse, like the school itself, had become on the central thoroughfare of what was now an expanded and entirely mixed Jewish community. Jews had moved well beyond, non-Jews had moved into this area, and it was, Vilna had become mixed. What I'm trying to suggest here is that Peril School was not only the happy beneficiary of changes afoot in the Jewish community of his day, but that it was also an active participant in those changes. Peril's school had become normative because Deutsche Gasse was no longer a liminal borderland, but now a mixed space. But by the same token, part of the transformation of the street must be understood as a result of the work of his school and others. The history of education has too often been viewed as illustrative. Historians write about changes in communities in which they study, and they use schools as ex an example. Look, you can see that something has changed because this school is teaching a different subject. Um, what is often not recognized is the causative nature of the educational institutions themselves. It should be obvious. We know the role that education has played in our own lives, in the lives of our near and dear ones, yet most historians have not granted it the status as an agent of change. In this work, I try to demonstrate the role of education in the transformation of the Jewish community in Tsarist Russia. And I'm not going to be able to go into that entire argument here, but I want to close with two examples of how that works. Um, the first one is Hebrew. As I mentioned, schools opened in the 1850s and afterward, that is private schools for Jewish girls, um, all offered Hebrew to the girls. Um, but these were the only schools in the Tsarist Empire of that period teaching Hebrew as a language. That is, in the Cheder, Jewish boys learned a formulaic uh, translation of the Hebrew biblical text into Yiddish, but they weren't actually struggling to do that translation themselves. They were memorizing it. And in the government schools for Jewish boys, um, Hebrew was not taught. There were no private schools for Jewish boys up until the 1870s, because until the government schools closed, they weren't going to allow their competition to open up legally. So the only place that Hebrew was being taught as a modern language was in these private schools for Jewish girls. And there were textbooks created. Again, in order to facilitate that, they had to work from scratch um, in order to do so. Now, at the turn of the century, with the advent of Zionism, there began to appear explicitly Zionist schools. This is a, a picture, a photograph of a uh, Cheder Matukan, which was one of the ways in which Zionism's taking over these uh, charity schools tried to teach um, about Zionism and Hebrew language and Jewish culture to students. Hebrew was a central subject in all of these schools, and they became very popular and much has been written about them, most of it claiming that it was entirely new, that Ivrit be Ivrit, the teaching Hebrew in Hebrew, but teaching Hebrew at all was invented in these schools. In fact, they were using t not only textbooks, but techniques developed in these private schools for Jewish girls. They were, like all educational institutions, learning from others who came before them. But that mostly isn't recognized, partly because there's been so little scholarship on these schools, but also because it's part of the Zionist narrative to come from nothing and be new and innovative in that way. Secondly, one other example. Uh, when I tell people, particularly Orthodox Jews, <clears throat> that I study 
uh, Jew education for Jewish girls in 19th century Russia, they inevitably say, oh, you mean like Sarah Schneer? And I say, no, actually, she taught girls in 20th century Poland. That's a different story. But over the years of answering this question many times, I have actually come to see that there is a link between Sarah Schneer and the Beis Yaakov movement and between these schools. And it goes as follows. The story told about the Beis Yaakov movement was that Sarah Schneer, this humble Hasidic seamstress, um, sort of out of the blue came up with this idea. She spent the war, the First World War in Vienna. She heard preaching there and she realized there should be education for Jewish girls. So she went back to her native Krakow after World War I and she opened this school system for Jewish girls, for Orthodox Jewish girls, and she was able to gain the support of the rabbinic uh, leaders of her era because they realized that Jewish girls were going to Catholic schools, were going to Polish schools, and were disappearing from the faith. And if they didn't do something about it, there wouldn't be anyone for the yeshiva bochers to marry. Um, but the part of the story that doesn't get told is why. Why were the Orthodox Jewish girls, or any Jewish girls, going to Catholic schools? Why were they going to Polish schools? Who said that they could? And I think that part of the answer goes back to these schools, that the emergence of these private schools for Jewish girls that allowed them to learn the language of the land and allowed them to get into Russian schools made it possible philosophically as well as just uh, logistically for Jewish girls to begin to attend secular or at least um, non-Jewish educational institutions. Um, so those are just two examples um, that I have. I, I could go into more of the lasting and fairly unknown contributions of these schools. There is not enough information at present to definitively link um, the 20th century, late 19th century radicals to these schools. But nonetheless, it's very clear that every girl, and there were thousands and thousands of them. I tried to work on numbers, and it's impossible to get an exact number, given that the schools opened and closed, and they didn't always, their information didn't always reach the Ministry of Education. But over 10,000, over 40,000, hard to say exactly how many. All of these girls went home. And if they went for one year to these schools, if they went for five years to these schools, if they, these schools allowed them to go to another school afterward, they went home with their knowledge of Russian. They went home with their knowledge of new approaches to the Jewish religion. And they brought those into the Jewish home. And certainly in that sense, these schools have also had a lasting effect and I think are important to bring back into the narrative of this period. Um, I think we have time for some questions, so. Yes, please. Um, yes, thank you for your comment, and I'd be interested to hear how, how she managed in the Russian school. But um, to answer your question, um, the, there were a series of laws meant to hold... Uh, so first, in 1844, the Tsar wants the Jews to become more Russian and enter Russian culture. After the assassination of Tsar Alexander II, the tide turned the other way, and there's all sorts of efforts to pull Jews out of the profession, out of education. Um, the, the May laws, the temporary laws, there are a whole series of laws that follow. They did not close private ed, um, educational institutions. What they did was limit um, Jewish access to public, well, they weren't exactly public, to, but to Russian educational institutions, but they only did so for boys. So Jewish boys were limited at 5% in the capitals, 10% in the pale, it varied a little bit from place to place um, of the school population of any of these given schools, but girls were not on the books anywhere. So there are years in which there are, you know, 9.9% .9 Jewish boys, for example, in a gymnasium in Odessa, 
and there are 13% of Jewish girls there. Um, sometimes they were limited de facto. The, the principals chose not to let them come to those Russian schools, but it wasn't uh, legally enforced. Oh, yes, thank you for asking that. Um, I, um, it, <laughs> there's always so much to say, it's hard to get out an answer. Um, I, I use a lot of quotes from the educators when I, when I have any quotes from them. And um, when I submitted this to, um, for publication, one of the comments with an extremely straight, boring title, one of the comments of the publisher, one of the readers was, why don't you take one of those beautiful quotes and make it into your title? Um, so the, the full quote is actually, in their hands lies the future of the next generation. And it's from a teacher by the name of Avram Brook Brzozowski, who had a school in Kherson. And he gave a number of public speeches, which were published in local papers um, on the occasion of the opening of his school and at the 10th anniversary of his school. And so that the speech is just a, a brief um, um, sort of remembrance of him. And I, it's, I explain it in the introduction. Um, great question. Um, nobody wanted to learn Yiddish. Yiddish was a very declassé language. Um, so I think that it, it made sense to Peril when he opened his school, oh, Jewish girls speak Yiddish, we'll teach them Yiddish. But that quickly went out of fashion and none of the other schools went in that direction. Yiddish sort of had a, a, a rebirth of sorts in later on. Um, I do think that these schools also, and I talk about this in the book, did contribute to some of the uh, um, Yiddishist schools, particularly in their focus on um, crafts, but that's uh, another question. In terms of your question, the why Hebrew? I don't know exactly why Hebrew, but languages were certainly central to these schools. Often between French and German and Russian, um, you know, math once a week. They were all about languages. So maybe it just made sense that as long as you're teaching languages. There are some schools where they specifically say that they're just teaching Hebrew reading. That is, they teach French grammar, Russian grammar, German grammar, and Hebrew reading. But over time, more and more of the schools, once they're teaching all those other languages, they, they begin to teach Hebrew as well. But I, I, don't, I haven't seen it written anywhere, a justification or an explanation. Um, yeah. Oh, yes, and I was supposed to do that all along. Sorry, repeat the question. Um, did Peril himself have daughters? Yes, he had four daughters and two sons. Um, and could that be a, a one of his motivations? Certainly it could be. Um, there's lengthy correspondence. Yehuda Leib Gordon, who's a Hebrew poet, but, but who also ran two different private schools for Jewish girls later on in the 1860s, um, interestingly, was very concerned about the education of his daughters. and was writing all over the country in his uh, correspondence trying to find tutors for his daughters that they should re reach a very high level of education, but he didn't think his school was enough. He wanted his daughters to go on from there and get a better Hebrew education. Um, so that might have certainly answered one question, but it didn't solve all of their problems. <laughs> yes, please. Yes. Yes, it's from a 1912, uh, it's from a 1912 celebration of a 25th anniversary of a Jewish girls' school. Um, so yes, the, it, it is, it's a great picture, but it, it shows a later period of art and design. <laughs> 
Um, but it's from a pamphlet that I found at Evo and just loved the image. Yes. Oh, absolutely there were. Yes, and I, I would, thank you. Other experiments of edu Jewish education in Poland, German lands, elsewhere, absolutely, yes. And in both of those cases, both Poland and in the German-speaking lands, they were ahead of Tsarist Russia. They started earlier. Germany really started already um, in the 18th century um, with some modern private schools. And um, Poland, the, the sort of rump Polish Congress Kingdom, which was left, um, was administered differently, and actually they were able to open private schools a little bit earlier. So that is to say, yes, there were some other examples to draw upon, um, but it's interesting, the, they don't talk about them very much. A lot of the educators talk about peril. That is, when they write into the government, they say, we want to have a school just like Cheville Peril. But they don't say, just like those great schools in the German lands or in Poland, which um, you might know about and be interested in also. So I, I think they were aware of those schools. They were certainly using some of their textbooks, but they were also really doing something new and something that was appropriate to their own setting. They, they couldn't draw on those schools entirely. What, what distinguishes the schools? Um, so a lot of that's a big question. What distinguishes the schools in, say, Germany or, or what was left of Poland to these Russian schools? Um, the, the religious environment in which the German schools were opening um, was very different. The expectations of what could be taught, how it could be taught, um, they, they were functioning in communities that were looking for modern approaches to Judaism in a way that the Russian Jewish community wasn't so much. The educators were more sort of in line and um, with the communities in which they were working there. Um, the state was also to some degree financing and but certainly supporting those Jewish schools um, in the German lands, in, in the Austrian Empire also, whereas um, these schools were I mean, yes, they did manage to sort of scrape by on some state funding, but it was very much in a backward way. They weren't state schools to any degree. They were very much more grassroots. And that also meant that they were more different one from another uh, in terms of the hours of study, in terms of the subjects of study. There wasn't any, there, there was very little oversight in these schools. It seems like I have sort of two examples from this whole period of schools being closed down. So maybe an instructor, you know, an inspector came once every few years. <laughs> um, but that's, that's part of an answer to a big question. Yes, please. Was there any experience in this opposition to the schools, especially in terms of funding? Yes, a Jewish opposition to the schools is the, is the question, and a good question. Um, not as much as you might think. Um, Peril does complain in his correspondence about being hounded by certain members of the Vilna Jewish community. And apparently his son was even illegally um, um, taken into the military when he shouldn't have been eligible because he'd graduated from gymnasium, which is not, probably had nothing to do with Peril's son and everything to do with his father being this prominent educator in a modern uh, school for Jewish girls. That said, these schools opened all over the place. In the heartland of Hasidism, in Berdichev, there's a school. Um, so there may have been some opposition, but I think that the schools managed to function in the communities in which they lived. They, they knew how far they could go, these educators, and they didn't push beyond that. Um, the schools to the modern eye look very traditional in, in many ways, um, except for even in, in the way that religion was taught, they look very old fashioned, but um, they were very proper I institutions in many ways, and um, there's not a lot of public opposition. There is writing about them. There's an awareness of these schools, and there's an awareness that they're part of the modern camp, part of the progressive camp within the Jewish community. But um, at the same time, I think um, there wasn't as much polarization within the Jewish community as there would be by the 20th century, and many families saw the clear advantages. A girl who had a year of math 
and Russian under her belt would be so much more useful in the family business than one who didn't, that it was, um, I think to a lot of families, it was a pretty easy choice. Yes, absolutely. French was the language of high culture in Russia, and it also ga ga gave them access to a lot of literature. And the girls, um, the, the, one of the things actually in terms of Gershon's question also, to the degree that there's opposition, is some, um, there begin to be some complaints about Jewish women and their reading habits. Um, sitting around reading uh, Schiller in particular, a lot of, lot of writing about Jewish girls just wasting their time reading these romances by Schiller. Um, so, um, so that's not a very strong opposition, but it's an awareness that this is opening up new worlds to these girls to some degree. Uh, thank you very much. I just want to remind you that there are books back there if you're interested. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Adler will be happy to sign them if you want. And um, we look forward to seeing you again at our next program. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.